are recording. All right. Well, welcome to Comic Con at Home, the Four Quadrants panel. It's great to have everybody join us today. This is a panel about publishing. We are going to talk about the four quadrants for purposes of trying to help you understand how to position yourself to get where you want to go in your publishing career. We've got the four quadrants as we define them are, are the big five publishers, actually big six, as, as Jonathan would point out. The number kind of changes from time to time through history. Um, we've got the big, the traditional Indian small press. We've got the print on demand and ebook publishers. And then we've got self publishing, which crosses over as you'll see. Um, I have a great group of panelists. My name is Brian Thomas Schmidt. I'm the moderator. I'm an author and editor of a bunch of different stuff, but we're going to skip all that. Let me introduce my fine panelists. I have six great people. Five of them are already on. One of them will be joining us. We're going to introduce him when the time comes. First of all, let me introduce Livia Blackburn. Livia is a New York Times bestselling author of novels like Rosemark and Midnight Thief, and as well as children's books. She's also a recovering brain scientist, and she has been a panelist in the past at San Diego Comic Cons. Next, we have Nancy Holder, who's also a New York Times bestselling author, uh, and she is the author of the Mary Shelley Presents comic series, as well as numerous novels, including tie-ins and things like Wonder Woman, Buffy, so on and so forth. And she's a frequent panelist as well at San Diego Comic Con. Our third frequent panelist at San Diego Comic Con may not be recognizable because she's not wearing a pink hat, but Jenny Koch is the New York Times bestselling author of uh, the Alien Kitty Kelly series of novels. And she. Kitty Cat. Oh, Kitty Ellen Cat. Kitty Cat. Kitty Cat. Sorry. <laughs> my fault. And she's a. Kitty Kelly, somebody else. <laughs> that, oh, Kitty, <laughs> I just changed the entire course of her history. Anyway, all right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Moving on. Next, Jonathan Mayberry is the ink part winning New York Times bestselling author of Joe Ledger, Rotten Ruin, and the V Wars series, which just became a TV show on Netflix, and you should all check it out. Hopefully, there's going to be another season somewhere else. And he is uh, the author of numerous comics like Black Panther and more. And he has also been a frequent panelist at San Diego Comic Con. Our next panelist is Andrew Main, and Andrew is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author of novels like The Naturalist Series and The Girl Beneath the Sea, which is his latest. He was also the star and an illusionist on A&E's Don't Trust Andrew Main, which is a fun little show you can find out there on YouTube and various streaming platforms. And he had a Shark Week special for Discovery, which we don't go into, but it's very cool. Y'all should check it out. I watched it. <laughs> And joining us shortly will be Scott Sigler, who's the number one New York Times bestselling author of titles like Nocturnal, The Galactic Football League, and his latest Aliens Phalanx, and he's also a regular for San Diego Comic Con. So welcome panelists, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. All right, so we're gonna start with the, with the, the big five, big six, whatever you wanna call it, quadrant of publishing. And I wanna have us start that off Jonathan, because Jonathan Mayberry has spent a good portion of his career in that. All of us have touched on it at some point, but I know it's been a particular focus with Jonathan. So let's talk about the pros and cons and pitfalls of Big Five, John. Well, I, I've been in Big Five ever since I, I broke into fiction. Prior to that, I was I was nonfiction, uh, college textbook training manuals and so on. But since I've been in fiction, I've sold, you know, uh, 40 some novels to the, to the Big Five publishers. And the reason I call it Big It's family owned. So it's, it's not a corporate big five, but it but it's technically one of the big six in terms of publishing volume and and uh, and structure. Uh, I've been with all, with those guys for years. Um, I haven't done any self publishing. I've, I've just done a traditional publishing, but I have also worked with uh, a number of uh, intermediate and smaller presses of various kinds, and a lot of comic book companies as well. Uh, the pros of working with them is that they have the money and, and the, the machinery to be able to promote your career, pay, pay the advances that, that can help you be self-sufficient while you're waiting for the, the, the royalties to roll in. Um, they have the, the uh, marketing and PR people who usually can get behind a writer and push. Exceptions are uh, sometimes newer writers don't get as much push as the top tier, but 
they can earn that spot through um, pushing their own careers through social media and so on. And sometimes that, that gets them more, more love from the, the, big, uh, the big corporations that then start pushing them. Um, also, they, the placement is, is amazing. You know, the big five will get you in every bookstore. They will get you, um, you know, on an uh, ebook. They will most often get you on an uh, audio book. Um, and all over the world, all over the world a lot of times too. All over the world. Now, it, that, that, that little bit depends. Sometimes they have a footprint overseas, like Macmillan. Macmillan has a UK division. Sometimes they don't, in which case they have to, they may choose to keep the, the rights to be able to sell them or your agent may negotiate that. Sure. But if the book is from one of the big five, it tends to get better reviews or more often, more frequent reviews, not better, but more frequent reviews. And it tends to get noticed by international markets. It's noticed by film uh, and TV people a little more not exclusively, but a little more. So th there's the cachet of the success and establishment of those big five that kind of gets behind your career when you publish with them. Great. Okay. Well, Nancy spent a lot of time in that sector as well. What are some thoughts you have on pros and cons? Anything that you can add? Um, that was a really good answer, Jonathan. Um, I think I would like to uh, just echo most of what he said. A con can be, again, if you're a newer author, sometimes you get a little lost in the corporate shuffle. And I will say that a lot of editors of necessity do a lot of job hopping. So you may start out with an editor who absolutely adores you and you may end up being what we call orphaned and then you get a new editor. The, the nice part is, is that your editor still works for the same company. Um, I've written for Harlequin and I always said they were like the blue angels that if you're if your editor dropped off, the, the, it still flew in formation. So I think that um, you're well taken care of, but a lot of times when you start out, you kind of have to pay your dues there right. of a, understanding that you may be lower on the list, lower on the totem pole until you start selling more books than just one or two. Right, cool. Olivia, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I actually, um, I started out thinking I would become an uh, indie author and um, kind of switched um, kind of unexpectedly. Uh, so I, I was all set, you know, start uploading my book and my friends told me, well, might as well just query some agents just in case, like, you know, what do you have to lose? Um, so I ended up doing that. And what changed my mind when I um, got offers from agents was, you know, they had some really good editorial insights about my story. And I realized that as, especially as a new writer, I could grow a lot by working with um, the editors, um, the people in the industry, uh, you know, you can pay for that yourself, but as a new author, also you don't have that budget a lot of the times. Um, speaking of budget, um, you know, for uh, well, my traditionally published books have been, um, well, the, their quality I've been very happy with. So for example, some of the covers, you know, they hired, you know, you get special photo shoots for the covers, you know, they hire a sculptor to uh, make a model cat for my cover, which I couldn't do that as an indie. You know, um, the books go through, you know, seven or eight rounds of proofreading, which I can't afford for my indie books. Um, and there's like little things like, you know, sending out arts, uploading, you know, they have to take care of all of that, which is nice. Um, yeah. The cost would be control and money per book. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit now about the uh, the second quadrant, kind of get into that as well, because I think, you know, there's there's all these crossovers. When we talk about traditional indie and small press, we're talking about publishers there's titan books as an example and one of the, the special guests at this year's comic con i don't know if he still is but he was going to be steve saffel who's one of the editors that a lot of us have worked with who's a nice guy and he's works with this company called titan it's a publisher a lot of us have worked with titan is not a big press they have big press distribution they do the traditional print run like a like a big five would but they they don't necessarily have quite the reach or, or resources though they do have a uk side and a u.s side um, so what are some of the pros and cons about working with the uh, traditional and indie small, Nancy? Oh, um, what I love about working for companies like Titan is that they know their market. They know their area. They have editors who know the properties that you're working on. And um, sometimes an editor at a larger company may not be the tie-in author or the author who knows all about Predator. And so when you go to someplace like Titan, they know they are also fans like you are, or they will become a fan like you are. And they, they understand the ins and outs of how to deal with production companies as well as authors 
because sometimes the production company doesn't like something the author does or they want to emphasize something and the Titan editors understand and other editors too. I don't mean to denigrate any other publishers, but I know a lot about Titan. So I would say that they have an expertise in that area. And they're able to kind of focus on their expertise. That is my experience, you know? Right, right. And, and one, one uh, thing about some of these medium, the small presses like Titan, Dark Horse, uh, IDW, they're also comic book companies. So they have a, another creative outlet and sometimes it, it makes it easy for you to cross over and publish in different forms within the same company, or sometimes even with the same editors. Right. Yeah, and they, there's also, you can have a small press within the big, the big five and six. Uh, I'm with DAW and uh, DAW functions like an indie publisher, even though they're part of Penguin Random House. Mm -hmm. So there's a tremendous number of advantages. It's like being in old old time publishing again. And but you have the distribution and the power and the marketing of everything that Penguin Random House has to offer with the added advantage of very focused attention from the editorial staff and the copywriting staff. You know, they're smaller. They're um, and, and this is again, like Nancy said, I'm not denigrating anybody else in the, in the bigger, no, no. bigger imprints, but you know, when you've got people, you can call anyone in that company and they know how to help you and know what to do. And you know, your editor maybe isn't available, but someone else can say, I can handle that for you. It's a really nice feeling. So, and yeah, so you know, also, and when you get to, yeah. I was Go just going to say, they also know each other, which is one real advantage, you know? I mean, they tend, yeah. big companies are huge. And I work, I work with, whether I work with, you know, Simon & Schuster or even St. Martin's, I'm getting different people all the time, as yeah, opposed mm -hmm. to, you know. Right, one, yeah, one, the consistency. One of the about, about, the, about those small presses, or small uh, divisions, imprints, a lot of them started out as the individual companies themselves and were absorbed into mm -hmm. But yes. they still yeah. keep a lot of their autonomy and, and their uh, their personality, their brand. There, there's, a, yeah. you know, there's a flavor to those small sure. presses that makes them unique and makes them appealing to, to writers. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah, and then all the crossover tends to happen in a lot of different ways these days. As we as we think about these quadrants, uh, I'm breaking them up this way because it's kind of the historical development of how publishing kind of unfolded, at least in modern publishing. But everything really started as small indie independence. So, you know, the big five thing didn't come about till later in the thing, but the big five kind of dominated. Yeah. And that's what everybody thinks of first is, as the publishing in a lot of, you know, when they dream about being a big author. So that's where we well, started. That's where you're going to get the, that's still where you're going to get the best distribution. Indies it is. have good, sure. the, the indies that are connected to the big guys have their distribution, which is great. But some of the smaller presses and some of the micro presses don't. So, they rely on a variety of their own kind of advertising and, you know, working their way in to bookstores, whereas there is no work needed by Penguin Random House to get in a bookstore. They, there are negotiations and contracts, but it's not, you're more likely to be in a bookstore immediately with big, big five or even the bigger traditional um, small presses than you are with a micro press, for example. Yeah, right. And, and hey, should we should we should point out. Is, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Nancy, go ahead. I um, I I was going to say I will break in, and um, we were talking earlier about the long tail by Chris Anderson, and I was hoping that Andrew might talk about this. That one of the disadvantages of being with the big five is you only have a small n window of time to prove yourself and mm -hmm. prove that you can keep that space on the bookshelf. And yet, if you are more independent of that, you can sell a few books over a long period of time and sell a lot of books. And I know yeah. Andrew was talking about this before. Well, let's talk about that, Andrew. Let's talk about pivoting. I mean, that's one of the advantages we've mentioned before of, about small press is that you can, you can pivot with the, the small press and indies can pivot faster than the bigger sometimes. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I started self-publishing and that was sort of my goal was I'm a person I cannot deal with rejection at all. I, I do not. I mean, if somebody can read my stuff and say it's not for me, that's fine. But the idea of sending some stuff off to some publisher in New York when I first started writing and waiting months to find out that I suck. I'm like, hey, I already know the answer to that one. Um, so, you know, the self-loathing part of it was already working well enough that I was just I never wanted to go that route. So my plan was I'm just going to start by self-publishing. 
and just putting my stuff at that point, I got into writing in 2011, right when the Kindle digital platform or digital publishing took off. And I just did eBooks and I could put an eBook out there and I could look at the response from readers and say like, Hey, I love this. I don't like this. And I could make my next book more tailored and prove on what I needed to do. I got in this pattern. I'd write a book, then I'd read a book on writing, then write a new book, taking everything I learned and putting it forward. The plan was just to do that for the next several years and just develop myself up as just, you know, a, an indie. And the second, the first novel I published, I wrote a novella. The second novel I published, that's when all of a sudden I got, you know, the Hollywood called, wanted to buy the movie rights. I got the agents asking me if I had representation. And so that plan got kind of derailed. And I'm like, well, maybe I do want to get published. Maybe this does sound cool. But it took a while because I wrote several books trying to pitch them to publishers and they didn't bite on anything. And then I self-published a novel. Thank you. I self-published a novel and <laughs> I it, it took on its own momentum and became sold over 100,000 copies as an indie. And then the publisher said, oh, we'd love to publish that series. And so that was my first series with Harper Collins, which is my Angel Killer series. And I made the decision to go work with them because I said, you know, I know nothing about this industry. I'm in a point now where yet they said yes. And I want to learn. And I learned a lot. I had a fantastic editor there that helped me learn so much and develop. And my the reason I got my first Thriller Award nomination, my first Edgar Award nomination came from that relationship. Mm -hmm. But I think that I was still kind of an ebook author at heart. I think my audience was still, you know, kind of that world. So I ended up doing, you know, now I'm with Amazon Publishing. And that's been a wonderful relationship because it's sort of ebook first. But I learned so much, you know, starting as an indie, how to improve as a writer, then working with publishers and learning from there. And I still work with print publishers, you know, around the world, favor other places like this, Euromedia, et cetera. And there's a lot to be learned from all sides of it, I guess is what I'd say. And I think that one of the things you need to think about with a publisher is some publishers might fit you better than others. Some models might fit you better than others. But I was totally prepared just to be an indie author the rest of my life. Don't you think some models also fit some books better than others? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you've got the other panels, example of people who write to different audiences and write to different markets. And, and, you know, I couldn't tell you what specifically a Jonathan Mayberry book is going to be. It's going to be good. I know that. But I know that he's a guy that can work in multiple mediums and do different things. I think that's the thing to think about is how do you reach your audience? Publishers, self-publishers, indies, there are a way to get there. And what we talked about just before was one of the advantages of starting off as an indie is when you're with a publisher, there's a clock ticking from the moment your book, even before your book hits bookstores, how many pre-orders uh -huh. do you get? You know, how many sell the first week? How many sell the second week? If you're four weeks in and your book's only sold a few thousand copies, they're like, eh, they'll write you off. Even though you might be building momentum and by the end of the year, you sold 10,000 copies. Publishers can't compute that. That just doesn't fit into most publishers' model for success, uh -huh. even though as an author, that's wonderful. And that's because they have to work so far ahead, whereas a lot of the smaller shops can work on a little bit tighter yeah. schedule and have a time to pivot, which I talked about earlier. And, you know, the thing about pivoting is that, you know, what we were ta all talking uh, another time, the, 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 the reality is that your, your big presses tend to be locked into a certain model, and that's the model that they're using. And they're having to scramble to adjust to an ever-changing market, because right now publishing is an ever-changing market, as is all of media. I mean, we're doing a Zoom meeting right now. A year ago, I never heard of Zoom. Three months ago, I hadn't heard of Zoom. The reality of it is it's changing. And Zoom has therefore all of a sudden become the thing we have to pivot to. So the reality is that there's all kinds of little things changing that they have to pivot to. And the smaller companies and self-publishers and all that tend to be in a better position, an easier position to do that. So talking about that, let's talk now about um, Jeannie. Why don't you take us into... Um, print on demand and ebook publishers, which are not, which are tools that everybody uses, but there are specific publishers that that's yeah. their focus. Yeah, um, there are, and this is this is for me the cautionary section of the quadrants because it needs to be a very good ebook and POD only publisher in order for it to be worthwhile for you to go. Um, they're still going to, you're not, they're going to do exactly what you could do self-publishing and too many of them don't do what a traditional, 
big five or traditional small press would do. They don't have the distribution that those companies do. They don't necessarily have the marketing. They don't have the advertising. They don't have any of these other things. And a lot of these companies, it's just somebody who's like, hey, I can do this. Anyone can do this. I'm going to throw up a shingle and now you're going to give me your books and we're all going to be rich, rich, rich. And it doesn't work like that. There are ebook POD only um, uh, imprints, uh, Karina out of, for Harlequin, for example, that's a safe one to go to. It's connected to a very big successful publisher and every one of the big five have or six, I don't know if Ken's even has this, this arm too, but I wouldn't be surprised, but they have an arm now that all they're doing is they aren't certain that they want to do print for those books. So they'll do you an ebook and then they'll roll you out into print on demand. And that's a great way to get in to the big five or the bigger uh, smaller traditional presses. But if it's just Joe Blow who threw up a sh shingle, you are burning your book to someone who's probably going to have a predatory contract because they don't know any better has no idea how to market your book, has no marketing plan, has no distribution plan, you are better off self-publishing in that case because that you, you're still going to have to do everything. You're going to have to, and you have more control over your cover. Um, I've seen some heinous covers. I've seen some great covers from these, but I've seen heinous covers. Um, I've seen terrible promotion. I've seen terrible marketing. And it's just, I went into that space to see because I'm in all four quadrants so, so I, I, at one time. And I thought, oh, I should go in here too, right? I'm in the other three. Never again. I backed everything out. I'll never do it again because they can't do – I have a marketing background. I was a marketing professional for 25 years before I came, became a full-time author. And I can do all that marketing myself, and I, and I can do it better than they were doing. But I have friends who have no marketing background that are still doing marketing better than these presses would have done. So the big – here is, is is definitely writer beware. You need to go in. It doesn't matter how great it sounds. We'll give you 50% royalties, but you get 100% of that because those royalties are coming from Amazon. They're not coming from Penguin Random House or Kensington or Macmillan. They're coming from Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. So you'll get half of what you could have gotten self-publishing. Now, right. again, now. the ones the heart, like Harper Voyager, Karina, those are great because you're attached to the big guy. Okay, let's talk. Livia, let's talk a little bit about contracts. Let's get you back in here. Um, we need, we talked, uh, let's talk about, you know, what the value of contracts. Contracts is an issue in, particularly in the smaller press areas, making sure you get a contract. It's an, it's an issue with everybody. I mean, like mm -hmm. the contract that I got when I did a book with Jonathan at St. Martin's was the first contract I ever received. Really? It was like 40 pages or something. I have to stop your video. Um, because <laughs> we're all at, we're all at home, and everybody knows. Yeah, we're getting interrupted. Sorry about that. <laughs> Livia, are you there? <laughs> I we think Livia's taking care of somebody. Uh, but, oh, okay. Yeah. So go ahead, Jonathan. Maybe you can talk on this. Yeah, contracts are, are a challenging thing. Um, most people don't know how to read a contract, and most if if you don't have an agent, you don't have an advocate who can contract and interpret its language and, and explain it to you because the simplest change of a word in a sentence can change the whole meaning of something. Mm -hmm. um, so I always advocate, if, if, no matter what tier of publishing you're with, if you do not have an agent, I recommend that people hire a lawyer, ideally an intellectual property lawyer but, or entertainment mm -hmm. lawyer, but somebody who can understand and interpret contracts so that you're not signing something where you might accidentally sign away uh, rights that you, you really should keep rights that might give you negotiating power mm -hmm. uh, or like I know when I first started out in, in magazine features I signed some contracts for articles where I you know I was so eager to get in print I would I signed away all rights yeah. um, and those articles get reprinted and reprinted but I don't have control over them and I would you know and you don't need more money right yeah well you may, sometimes you, they make you make a little more money but you, you it's not the point you want control of the piece because you may sure. want to revise it, it. You may choose, want to choose where it gets reprinted and where it doesn't get reprinted. Um, but also, there, there are some things that you can sign away that, that um, show, you know, show that you, you don't understand what's going on. The publisher of any tier, when they're creating a contract, they're creating it with a bias toward their needs, not toward yours. Um, they assume that you will have someone as your advocate 
looking out for your needs. And it's like a negotiation. They, they offer this much, your agent wants that much, and somewhere in the middle is the deal you're going to make. That's right. not only true with the writing, it's true with the rights. And sure. you have to have someone that, uh, who, who can advise you on which rights to agree to and which not to agree to, because everything you do will follow the rest of your career. And you don't want to, besides, you don't want to set a, uh, a standard of, I, I, you know, that says basically, I don't know what I'm doing, take advantage of me. And unfortunately, right. it comes off yeah. that way. Now, one last little point about this. Uh, sometimes the contracts that, that are, you're offered from medium and small presses and, and even some of the, the cooperative self-publishing presses where it's several self-publishing people together, the contracts are, are often uh, cobbled together from things they find online. They aren't necessarily a coherent and effectively written uh, uh, business instrument. So you can negotiate the content of those contracts and should, in fact. Sometimes, like I've worked with a couple small presses where uh, my agent and I have had to school the publisher on how to write a contract because the version- Oh my God, so was, often. Yeah. yeah. So the often. We, we now, as experienced pros, would look at it and say, I would never sign that. But our yeah. the first contract we ever saw, we think, oh man, I'm going to be in print. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Livia, why don't you talk a little bit about, uh, you, you know, you and I have talked before about- um, the importance of like, for example, the, uh, the out of print clauses and such. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> I was just wondering because I skipped off, I don't know if anybody mentioned it yet. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, we talk about books like the publishing path, sometimes that's one or the other, but actually you can do both even with the same uh, project. So, you know, for books, um, you know, uh, publishers have them for a while and depending on your reversion clause, sometimes you get your rights back, you know, sometimes depending on um, what out of print means in your contract, maybe sales dip below a threshold or something like that. And so, you know, just be very careful about that. You know, I've had books that have been with publishers that are now back with me and now I'm self-publishing for a higher cut of the sale of each book, you know, and I can promote it better at a lower price point. Um, so definitely be very careful about that. Um, regarding contract negotiations as well, um, if you're starting out, you can't really afford an agent or lawyer. The Authors Guild um, offers um, free contract advice for members. Um, so that is one low price option. I yes. want to wait. You said afford. Wait, wait. She said afford an agent. You never afford an agent. You oh, don't uh, pay them. Uh, okay. No, no, no. But the, no, right. But it's well, a, it's a really important thing because for new people that are listening, though, uh, yeah, you hire and you pay a lawyer. You don't pay your agent. Your agent takes a cut of what normally fifteen percent of what they sell for you. So yeah. Yeah. If the yeah, agent asks you to pay them, that's not them that's them. not an agent. That was, if they ask yeah. you to pay, run, run, don't walk, yeah. run in the other I, direction. I cut out for a little bit. I just want to make a little thing too about lawyers is, um, it, it, Jonathan mentioned this is like make sure you get somebody who has some experience at this early on. When I first got into entertainment, I didn't know any of it entertainment law. I'd have, a, oh, my friend is a lawyer, he could look at it. The worst advice I ever got were from lawyers who had no experience in entertainment or, or intellect. I, I did a better job than they did. Cause they were like, and because you get something like, oh, I'd like to take a look at this because maybe it's an, they, you don't want their first contract they ever do at to be yours because it will, and I fortunately, I was able to quickly find better representation, but be very, very careful about that. Um, yeah, it's true that even though if you think something's in print, that doesn't mean it's enforceable. And there are a lot of conventions in what we might call entertainment that a lawyer who does estate planning is not going to know about. And mm -hmm. so, yes, maybe your brother-in-law did go to law school, but don't depend on his advice because there yeah. are conventions in publishing that sound weird to other areas of the law. To get, to get a little more specific and add one little thing. The reason that this is so important is, for example, if you're, it, it, the, 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 the out of print clause is going to determine how many sales constitutes in print. If your book is an ebook, it's always in print, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you ha don't have a limit on how many units per month they sell or per year or whatever it is, then mm -hmm. they can say the book's still in print because it's out in ebook and it's been on the market. And right. you can never get your rights back. You can never get an opportunity to explore various other options. So that's why and, and you we're need talking to be so much about this. For, you need to be prepared for a publisher to not want to give you the rights back, even though they're not doing anything with your book. Um, I'm in a situation with one of my books. Uh, this is not with, with DAW, but I'm not, I'm not going to name the publisher, where we put in a very low sales clause and every time we're near where they're not going to hit it, they suddenly do a little promotion. 
and sell enough copies, ebook or physical, to flip us like two books over the limit. So you really have you wanted the lowest possible number, and you still may not get them back even if you want them. Yeah, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, one more thing about lawyers. Uh, with some entertainment lawyers, you can also to negotiate a deal where instead of paying them, if you want a lawyer to be able to advise your career, especially if you're moving into the Hollywood space, you can, instead of paying the lawyer up front, you can also negotiate a percentage deal. So my agent gets 15%, the lawyer gets five as an ongoing uh, retainer, um, and that becomes his fee. So he only works on the on the, the contracts with the deal that I need his input on. So you sure. can, act, you know, it, it, it's another way of, of, of having not to be out of pocket, mm -hmm you know, up front, but you still have that, that person as another, another advocate, you know, working on your behalf. I would also okay. like to I want to go ahead. I, I, we really need to move on to self-publishing. So this will be the final comment on this. And then I'm going to have Andrew start us off talking about self-publishing and particularly audiobooks. So go ahead, Nancy, last comment. Um, I just wanted to say that it's important to remember that while we are writing from our hearts and often our editors are editing, editing from their hearts, if your editor works for someone else, they are also in business. And it may be that your editor can't warn you, this is a bad contract, or think, oh my God, she signed it. Even if your editor loves you to death, they still work for a company and it is still a business. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So let's talk about self-publishing now, which is an area that Andrew's pretty much an expert in, but I want to particularly emphasize how important audiobooks have become right now for this, because audiobook is really driving the market right now. Well, I don't have uh, too much experience on the self-producing of the audiobooks as much as Scott does. Scott Sigler, who uh, I guess he was able to make it here. He's really expert on that, but audiobooks are a big growing part of the market. And one of the things that started happening is you get a lot of audiobook publishers are going around and going to indie authors and they're offering low ball rates to get the audiobook rights because producing an audiobook is expensive. It's much more difficult than producing a regular book. To produce a really good quality audiobook can cost $10,000. And the thing is though, is that it's a market that keeps getting larger and larger and larger. And I've held off in some cases of selling rights to some of my books because I think you know the value's there. Amazon has a program called ACX, which can be very good or cannot be. ACX lets you go in and say, hey, I want to find a narrator for my audiobook, and they have a lot of narrators that can do this. The challenge is, and you would split the profits with them. If somebody there wants to do it, you can either share profits or you could pay them, hire them. If you find somebody wants to do it and they do a bad job of it, you're stuck with that. And even some small publish publishing companies and small presses will use ACX and I have friends that regret the fact that their audiobooks got poorly produced there because they can't get those rights back, you know, unless they're able to do some sort of buyout. And so I think it's worth looking very, take a look at the ACX program, but realize you want to have control of your narrator. And there are a number of audiobooks that I won't listen to, even though I love the author, because I can't stand the narrator. And that's a problem you have to deal with. But it is a growing area of self -pub or growing area of the publishing market in, in general. So what are the pros and cons of self-publishing, generally speaking? So to guys. this day, yeah, to this day, I will get an email like, hey, I love your books, but I just read this one. And man, there are a lot of grammatical mistakes in there. You know, what happened? And I have to write, that was my first ebook. The proofreader I hired was right out of college. They didn't know how to write, you know, proofread this. And it is a thing that constantly to this day that comes back to sort of haunt me is that my first books were not as well proofed as they could have been. And I would say that's a downside. And if you're going to spend money on something, if you know the book is good and the feedback's good, you don't need developmental editor, proofread, 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 and a good cover. A lot of times people have great books and they cheap out on the cover. And I, I mean, you can spend a hundred, a couple hundred dollars, you can get a great cover, simpler, sometimes better. And there's a dramatic difference. People look at the cover. We don't judge a book by a cover. Guess what we do? Particularly when it comes to eBooks, we go to Amazon, that thing pops up, but we don't like that image. We're not going to look at it. It could be the best book in the world. We, we never will look at it. So I, I, have a good cover. Yeah. What's that? I totally judge books by their cover. I'm always saying, look, if it, yeah. looks, if it looks crappy on the outside, I'm assuming they, they put just as, much, the just as much time yeah. and effort into the inside as they did the outside because they obviously didn't care about the outside. That is just an, a natural reaction. So, yeah, I mean, you definitely, you're right on. What are other thoughts on self-publishing? There's certainly some ad more advantages. So ahead, are, Liv, I think that you, yeah, Liv, Livia, go ahead. Okay. Uh, one is that you can sell at a sustainably, uh, you have 
the lowest overhead of any of the four categories, and you can sell sustainably at a low price point. You know, you can have an ebook at two ninety nine and still make higher, more money on that than on a regular price traditional book. Sure, uh, and you can switch your price pretty fast too, right? That's right. Yeah. You, know, you can pivot quicker yeah. than any of the others do. Yeah, I mean, and Andrew, t technically, you could bring those books down, correct all those errors, and reissue them as. Um, you know, the next, the next printing, the next edition, Revise and, <laughs> you know, you, you can, I, I, uh, I advise it, honestly, it, it uh, I did that with a couple of mine, where we missed like six typos, and I'm like, I'm so tired of people telling me about <laughs> these same six typos, pull it down, we're fixing it, put the blurb that I got for it from somebody on the cover now, and now it's second edition, and I have no one telling me, you know, this is the wrong your. It's like I'm just shoot me now, just shoot me now. Yeah, I, you're I had absolutely a, right, but there, there's one factor. I'm lazy. Well, I had a, <laughs> I had a book that had a typo that happened to be a very vulgar word, and yeah. it was, you know, instead of the word count, well, let's just say one letter was left out, and my, and my mother pointed it out to me. So I, I you can bet I fixed that as soon as I could. I uploaded new files. On the other hand, um, I, have a, I have a book with the big five, and there are two significant typos in this book. Yeah. One really big, because it was a scene where I thought, oh, we forgot to put so-and-so in this scene. Having forgotten, we'd sent her off on her own adventure. She could never have been in that scene. And we told the publisher, please take that name out of the scene. It will fix it. But they that's, have never done it. Never. And it's been in yeah, for 20 years. It's amazing years. how much a copy editor at, at a traditional press can, how many errors they can put in your book. Well, yeah, you know, the other thing about, painful. the other thing about this that's really, really important to remember, you know, I'm an, I'm an editor and I do a lot of proofing for people, is that one of the advantages that I found in self-publishing is you can fix these things. I have to, you know, these errors that keep coming up that Andrew's talking about, if he's too lazy to fix them, that's on him. But the reality is right. when I have a book with a big publisher, they're not going to fix it. They've got a warehouse full of books they're going to sell. Right. It's not going to get fixed. They don't exactly. care. And half the time, they're not going to bother to fix the ebook either because they've already sailed that ship and they don't right. want to go back and do all that. You right. can fix Again, it that because you control publisher, it. Though. But that sure. also depends on your project for Dahl. Dahl will fix those. We had a huge um, issue in the second book of the Alien Catherine Kitty Cat series. Um, in, Alien, in Alien Tango, they somehow dropped like a paragraph and a half. So you go from one page to the next, there's no, it makes no sense because you need those, those things. And I called them, they fixed the ebook immediately, and then the next print run, they fixed it. So... It depends on yeah. your press. Some presses okay. will do it. So yeah, I just add, have, I use Vellum Pub to fix. Actually, I, when I get these the notes, I do fix them. Vellum.pub is great as an app because it's easy to fix stuff and update those right away. I I want to switch to our last question because we have five minutes left, and it's kind of relevant because with George Floyd and everything that's going on in the world right now, I really wanted to talk about this. And I know Olivia has some comments. So we'll start with her, but then everybody else can kind of jump in. Jonathan has that experience as well. Has your race, gender, religion, or age, or anything like that ever affected you in any of the quadrants and how? Okay, I'll talk about race since other people can talk about being uh, you know, women. Um, so uh, with Midnight Thief, my debut, it didn't really affect me that much, I don't think. And that is because it was a European fantasy. I write under Olivia Blackburn, you can't tell I'm Asian. So any kind of biases that might have influenced um, my career. I don't like people didn't even, I, I passed this white basically. Um, but hold on Rosie, <laughs> let me just finish the sentence. Um, that's my daughter. Uh, so um, uh, with my picture book, it was my first kind of truly Chinese book. It was about a Chinese girl who immigrated. I did notice um, a trend there where, you know, we went out to 10 editors, nine were not Chinese and one was Chinese. And so with the nine non-Chinese editors, um, two were interested. And what the one Chinese editor was interested. So just in terms of percentage interest, you know, there's a big difference there. And it's not because people were racist, but it's probably just because, you know, you naturally identify with experiences similar to yours. Um, so then you can see if you're a minority and publishing is mainly white editors, then, you know, that can be a structural problem. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I had a... There's... Oh, go ahead, please. Good. No, Jonathan, you go. I'll go next. Um, I had an interesting experience with uh, the comic book world where uh, I had been um, 
uh, asked to be the, the ongoing writer for Black Panther, the comic book, after several high profile black writers have been writing the book. And it was kind of a, you know, a, a moment where there was, there was some pushback that why is a white guy uh, writing the book? And, you know, I had, you know, what came out in the news story was that the reason I was picked for it is because as a kid, I grew up in a, in a household where racism was a very big thing. My father was in the KKK. The neighborhood was very racist. And it was the, the introduction of the Black Panther and the old Fantastic Four comics that started opening my eyes and led me to an understanding of what racism truly is and, and so on. And I had been talking about that early on in my, in my career with Marvel. And uh, the, uh, Reginald Hudlin, who had been writing the Black Panther, heard that and said, well, you know, that's crazy. But, you know, the Black Panther saved this guy's life, too, and, and changed the course of his life. Let's have him come on and write the book. And I went up going in and writing the book. And there was pushback. But then that story got out more. And Marvel got behind it and pushed it, put me on you know, some speaking engagements and so on. And that became a, a, a talking point, even to the point where the, the actors from the Black Panther movie, some of them reached out to me and, and even had me sign copies of my uh, collection of my complete run of Black Panther. Because, you know, like, like a lot of kids who grew up in, in the inner cities, you know, that character stood as a symbol. And uh, so it was a positive, a very upbeat thing for me, but, but there was some, some strong pushback at first. You know, the, the uh, one thing I want to point out about this that's really important is, you know, there's a uh, publishing's a business and they're always thinking about things in terms of market share. You might say there's not enough books about uh, uh, LGBT out there and they're going to say, well, look at the numbers of the percentage of the audience. We're trying to meet that percentage. One of the things you can do with some of the smaller presses, your self-publishing, your other options, is you can really get good at putting out these kind of books for other markets that aren't represented well. So it's really valuable because they can get really good at it and they can know how to market an Asian's books, for example, to the, for, to the Asian market, or they can LGBT books or whatever. There are specialty markets for all of these things and they may not get as much attention from the big five, but some of these small presses and certainly self publishers can really, really, really take over that market. Can really I well. clarify well, that think, on, on, on that? Um, because one of the things the big five can often do and also smaller presses and self-published if they have the right media savvy is not only play to play to uh, their own audience but use that book as a way of starting conversations with a much broader demographic sure uh, we did sure. that with daughter, cool. the, the smoke and bone book and, and quite a few others um where it, it didn't get read just by black audiences it got read by everyone because they marketed it really strongly and that was something that the big five can do uh with their money and, and individuals can do with their social media platforms. Yeah. So yeah, there's advantages of both. I think what well, they I want, think. I think what you want is a book that crosses over. That's, <laughs> a, that's what's successful. That's what everybody wants. They want a book that will hit in all the quadrants. Like when the first X-Men movie came out, I was complaining and uh, it worked great because it appealed to people who'd never seen, I've never read the comics. All right. Well, on that note, I, I need to say, well, we got to wrap up. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We have a, we have a tight limit, and I apologize, Nancy. But you guys all had a lot to say that was really helpful, and I want to thank you for that. I'm sorry Scott couldn't join us, but maybe next time. Thank you guys for making this panel happen. This is where we all applaud the panelists, but we can't really do that. So let's just applaud each other because I enjoyed, I enjoyed this time with you guys, and I really thank you for your friendship and your support of me. Everybody, thank you for joining us on the panel. We hope it's helpful to you. Great success in your publishing. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.